Hello Church, I'm Rachel Sanchez, a ministry assistant here. If you are new to Canyon Hills, welcome. Make sure to scan the QR code on the seat in front of you or head to the I'm New tab on our website to get connected. We also ask if you're attending the 9.30 or 11 o'clock service to please fill in the seats in the middle of the row first so there is room for everyone. We are just two weeks away from our annual marriage conference on October 6th and 7th. If you haven't already, make sure to register online or through our app for this opportunity to hear from pastor and author Dave Harvey, who wrote When Sinners Say I Do. Come grow in your understanding of applying biblical principles for a God-honoring marriage. If you are interested in serving the body of Christ through leading a life group, we want to invite you to join our three-week life group leader training starting Sunday, October 8th at 1230 in room 201. This is an opportunity to equip future leaders and answer any questions you might have in stepping into the role. Lastly, as you head out of service today, make sure to stop by our global outreach table in the lobby. There's staff available to talk with you if you'd like to learn more about how you can participate in the mission to make more and better disciples of Christ through upcoming events, global encounter trips, and more. Thanks for joining us for church today. We're glad you're here. Good morning. Go ahead and stand to your feet if you would. Today we wrap up our Psalms 23 series. And so we're turning our attentions towards the things of heaven, the things of dwelling in God's house forever. And so our prayer is that you would stop focusing on the things of earth today, but maybe turn your eyes upward towards the things of heaven. Let's do it and let's sing together. Here we go.
just stay in this attitude of worship and go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and bow your head, close your eyes. I think far too many times I focus on the things of this earth way too much. Focus on things that may be good things, but aren't ultimate things. And today during our prayer time, as we focus on the things of heaven, my question to you is this, are there things in your life that you've been looking to, to provide ultimate comfort, ultimate security, ultimate happiness in this life? You've been looking to those things and you just know they can't provide that. What are those things? Because the truth is ultimate security will come in heaven. Ultimate joy will come in heaven. Ultimate sinlessness will come in heaven. So what is that thing that you've been putting your hope and your trust in? Confess that to the Lord right now. Father, we confess to you that we focus on the things of this world far too much. We look to the things of this world for our ultimate hope far too often. And so we confess to you, God, that we're sinners that need your help. And so today we turn our attention towards heaven towards that glorious day where all things that are wrong now in our hearts will be made right. Lord, that glorious day when we will see you face to face. But until then, we join with heaven singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You are worthy of all the praise. We give it to you today. Amen. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us, and all who will believe. We'll sing the song of ages to the land. And your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. Above all.
dictator, president, no authority on this earth even compares to the power of your name. You are king of kings, Lord of all lords, and we worship you today. We set our hope towards heaven from that's where our help comes from. We love you and worship you. It's in your mighty, powerful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Church, today is a pretty unique and special day. If you remember a few months ago when Pastor Steve made the announcement that there was a transition coming up and that I was transitioning out of worship ministry, uh, one of the first things that he charged me with was finding my replacement. Um, And this, over the last couple months, has been a pretty bittersweet task because Being the worship pastor of this church has been a joy uh, and a privilege for these last 14 years, but almost two weeks ago, that search came to an end, and uh, after a lot of prayer and a lot of consideration, the elders of the church have invited Andy Simo to be our next worship pastor. You didn't have to clap quite that loud. (laughs) It's very similar to the experience in the elders meeting. They also were very excited and I was concerned all of a sudden. So, um, no, we have absolute confidence that Andy is the right man for this job uh, for a number of reasons. Obviously, musical gifting is not an issue, but more important than that, I've had just the opportunity over the last three years to work really closely with Andy. I've got to see him as a husband. I've been able to see him as a father. I've been able to see the way that he loves this ministry and loves this church. And so beyond any physical gifting, what gives me the most excitement about this next chapter is Andy's a man of honor. Andy's a man of integrity. Uh, and he's a godly man. I don't think there's a higher compliment that I can pay you. So I'm looking forward to this next season. I hope that you are as well. Would you just welcome our new worship pastor one last time? All right. Well, why don't you get your Bibles open to Psalm chapter 23. Today has already been Such a blessing to just be able to worship with eternity in mind, and that's the direction that we're going to continue the rest of our time together. Today, we conclude our walk through line by line, verse by verse, through probably one of the most uh, famous passages in Scripture, if not the most famous passage of Scripture, Psalm chapter 23. And so today, we're landing on that last verse, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, if you're paying attention, you would notice that we actually skipped a verse getting here. We should be on, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We're not skipping that because it's not meaningful or it's not uh, impacting for our life today. There's a lot of beautiful truth in that uh, small phrase. However, you may remember a month or two ago, we had a guest speaker here, Dr., uh, Pastor Philip DeCourcy, 
Um, and he did a phenomenal job walking through that very text. So he didn't feel like it was going to be necessary or beneficial to try and rehash that a second time. If Pastor Steve was doing it, probably would have been great. But you have me today, and that's like eating hamburger after steak, and that's not good for anybody. So we're going to mo- mosey on along uh, and settle in on this very last phrase, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so the question that I would ask you as we begin our time today is this. Where is your ultimate hope anchored? Where is it that you have anchored your hope in life? Follow-up question, how often do you think about heaven? How often do you allow your perspective of heaven to offer you a corrected perspective of your life, your decision-making in the here and now? How often as you walk through just the daily turmoil and struggle of life, do you look to heaven for an accurate perspective on reality? I recently read this little book that was recommended to me by a guy here in the church. It's called Father Ten Boom. Uh, and it's written by Corey Ten Boom, who was a famous Holocaust survivor, most famous for the book that she wrote that turned into a movie called The Hiding Place. And she wrote this book as just kind of a character sketch of who her dad was, the things that he valued, the things that pri- he prioritized, the things that drove him. And Casper, Casper Ten Boom led, from an earthly perspective, a pretty unremarkable life. But from an eternal perspective, he led an incredibly remarkable life. He grew up in the city of Harlem in the Netherlands. He was a watchmaker by trade, and he opened his first jewelry shop when he turned 18. The problem was he was never much of a businessman, so the business always struggled. There was never really any money to provide for the family. In fact, he went bankrupt on multiple occasions throughout his life. His wife, whom he absolutely adored, died after a long season, a long and drawn out season of suffering. And yet, Casper Ten Boom was one of those men whose eyes were always focused on the blessings that he had been given by the Lord rather than the things that he either had lost or had never received. In 1940, the Nazis moved into and started to occupy Harlem in the Netherlands. And immediately, Casper opened up his home as a safe house Uh, as a refuge for any Jew that was seeking asylum. Because Casper believed that the Jews were God's chosen and loved people. So he saw it as an act of personal worship and honor to the Lord to be able to provide for them in any way that he could. So after so much sacrifice for his family, after so much risk from his family, they continued to sacrifice all that they could to save and protect as many of God's people as they could. And it worked for a while until one day in February 1944, after being turned in by a Dutch informant, that the Nazis showed up to Casper's house and rounded up everybody and took them off to prison. And they were all taken to this, what Corey describes when she wrote, this kind of warehouse space that was serving as the Gestapo headquarters. And in the midst of all of the people, at some point, the chief interrogator's eyes fell on Casper. Now, Casper was an old man at this point. He was 84 years old. And the Nazis viewed him as a misuse of resource and money to even keep in prison. And so the man, when he saw Casper, he called him. He said, you, old man, come over here. And so Casper's son, Willem, who was also in prison with him, guided his old father over to the chief interrogator. And the chief interrogator looked Casper in the eyes and he said, old man, I would like to send you home. Can I be confident that you will cause us no more trouble? And as Corey writes, she said she wasn't able to see her father's face. All she could see was his erect shoulders and the halo of gray hair that stood above them. And while she couldn't see his face, she could hear his words clearly and evenly as he looked the chief interrogator in the eyes. And he said, sir, if you send me home today, then tomorrow I will open my door to any man in need who knocks. That was the sentence that sealed Casper Ten Boom's fate. He only survived 10 days after his arrest. His last view of his family was as they were all being led off to concentration camps. All three of his daughters, his one son, even one of his grandsons was being imprisoned. And yet the last words that we have recorded that he spoke to his grandson Peter as he was being led away were these. He said, my son, are we not a privileged generation? As I read those words, I was left wondering, 
What drives a man like Casper Ten Boom to walk so peacefully and faithfully into that final valley of the shadow of death? What is it that would drive a man to ignore the temptation to self-preservation with just a word that no one would have faulted him for? He would have been set home except for he decided and was committed to doing the right thing no matter what. I would contend that it was because Casper shared David's perspective. He was not only confident in his shepherd's presence in the valley of the shadow of death, he was confident in his shepherd's promise in the valley of the shadow of death. He wasn't living only for today. He was living for eternity. My prayer for us this morning is that by the conclusion of our time, we may share in both Casper and David's view of life, not just the life here today, but most importantly, the life that is to come. So with that, if you have your Bibles open to Psalm chapter 23, let's stand for the reading of God's word. Beginning in verse one, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Here it is. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your word. And we're grateful for the testimony of David that ministers to us and encourages us thousands of years later. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would do in this time what only your spirit can do. That you would stir our attentions and our affections, that we would pull our eyes away from the immediate and from the temporary and that we would set them back on eternity, our true hope. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You can be seated. All right, so if you're a note taker, here is the big idea for today. Our ultimate hope as believers is that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's our big idea. That's also actually our entire outline for today. That's as far as my creativity could get us for today. The truth that should carry us through the sweet pastures of life, the truth that should lead us to the still waters of satisfaction, the truth that should sustain us even in the deepest and darkest moments of the valley of the shadow of death. It's this truth that today is not all that there is. That before us lies the promise that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's my belief that our view of eternity is what allows us to build a bridge of hope over our current circumstances. There are three elements to this big idea that I want us to spend a little bit of time on this morning. We're gonna look at the confidence of our hope. We're gonna look at the destination of our hope. And we're gonna look at the duration of our hope. So point number one is this. Looking back at our big idea, our ultimate hope as believers is that we will. If you're taking notes, underline the word will. That we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Notice David's confidence. Notice the confidence that he has in his shepherd. As he's looking back over the course of his life, he's taking an inventory and seeing how the shepherd, how the good shepherd has faithfully cared for him from the moment that he was born to the moment that he penned this psalm. And most people believe that David, at this point in his life, he's already an old man. And that as he's writing Psalm 23, he's looking back over the history of his life. He's taking an account of all of his successes, all of his failures, all of his struggles, all of his achievements. And he has seen God faithfully care for him every moment of every day. He has seen the goodness and mercy of the Lord pursuing him. And he is absolutely confident that the Lord will continue to be faithful to him as he moves on into the future and into eternity. He is being reminded of how his shepherd has never failed him and he is confident that he never will. Notice he didn't say, and I might dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
Notice how he didn't say, if at the end of my life, the good things that I've done seem to outweigh the bad things that I've done, then maybe I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. No, he says with absolute certainty and expectation that at the conclusion of this earthly life, he will dwell in the presence of his shepherd for all of eternity. What David models and expresses here is the kind of assurance that is available to all of us as followers of Jesus even today. Even though King David lived long before Jesus came and lived and died, his hope was still anchored in the promised salvation of his God. And this is an important theological note for us to spend a moment on. All people for all have time have only ever been saved by the finished work of Jesus. Those who came before Jesus, like David, they looked forward to his finished work on the cross. And those who came after Jesus, like you and I, we look back on his finished work on the cross. The gospel is the only means by which anyone can be saved. And if you don't know what we mean by gospel, and in a room this size, there's, size, there's probably always someone who doesn't, the gospel is the simple and yet profound truth that Jesus came to the earth. The son of God came to the earth. He took on flesh. He lived the perfect life that you and I could never live, but that the justice of God demanded. He died on the cross, a horrible death that you and I deserve because of our sin and because of our failure. But three days later, he rose again. And when he rose, he demonstrated his power over sin and death. Sin and death were broken. And our hope for all of eternity, for all of his people was secured. This is the hope of the gospel. And that is our confidence. When Jesus gave up his spirit on the cross, he declared, it is finished. It is done, period. And I don't want to move too, past, too quickly past this. This assurance of salvation, it's an incredible gift, not just for eternity, but also for us today. What it means is you and I no longer have to worry or wonder what it takes to please God. You and I don't have to wonder what it means, what we have to do to be saved. The two most important questions that anyone can ever ask. Number one, is there a God? Number two, if there is, what does this God expect of me? And the finished work of Jesus on the cross tells us plainly and definitively there is nothing that we can do to add to our salvation or take anything from our salvation. When he went to the cross, any who put their faith in him can have absolute confidence that your hope is secured for all of eternity. We no longer have to concern ourselves with how to impress God. We no longer have to live our lives trying to earn his favor because if you are in Christ, you are already favored by God. 1 John 5.13 says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Our ultimate hope should be anchored in our confidence in the truth that our future is secured. But not only does our passage give us confidence in this hope, our passage gives us the destination of our hope. So point number two, looking back at our big idea is this. Our ultimate hope as believers is that we will, if you're taking notes, underline the words, dwell in the house of the Lord. We know where we're going. It's been promised to us. The scriptures have laid it out for us. Our destination is heaven. The New Bible commentary suggests that the word here for dwell literally means I will return to the house. The idea being that after all of earth's paths and valleys and struggles and threats are over, then comes the real return home. I love that. It's the returning to the place that we actually belong. I don't know about you, but I know that I do not spend nearly enough time thinking about heaven. I have become far too content with things here on earth. C.S. Lewis addressed my sentiment pretty bluntly when he wrote this. He said, indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. 
we are far too easily pleased. Church, more than I care to admit, this is me. I have spent far too much time and money and energy and thought and resource trying to create heaven here on earth, trying to find satisfaction here on earth. But listen, it was never meant to be found here. This world was never meant to bear the weight of heaven. And like David, I think our perception of this life would change dramatically if we allowed it to be eclipsed by the vision of what is to come. So the question becomes, what is coming? Well, Revelation 21 tells us that our God is creating a new heaven and a new earth and that he's going to make his dwelling with us as his people. Think about that for a moment. The day is coming when we will dwell in perfect presence and relationship with God. Everything that was lost to us in the Garden of Eden is restored to us here in Revelation chapter 21. On this day, our bodies are going to function as they were always meant to function. Our spirits are going to function as they were always meant to function. Our relationship with God will finally be what it was always meant to be. Now, I realize that in a room this size, I am still a relatively young man. But I have lived long enough to know that my body started changing when I was 30. And now I'm staring down the barrel of 40 and I'm not all that excited about what's coming. Like I used to only get hurt doing dumb or adventurous things. Now I get hurt just like getting out of bed or getting out of the car. (laughs) So there was a guy that stopped me in the bathroom where all good conversations happen this morning. And he was like, hey man, I hate to break it to you, but the day is coming where you don't even have to get out of bed to get hurt. And I was like, (laughs) go and be blessed. That was, it was really a low point of the morning for me. But listen, that is heaven. Where our bodies are finally what they're meant to be. Our spirits are finally what they're meant to be. Our relationship with God is finally what it was meant to be. Revelation chapter 22 says that we're going to see the face of God. Think about that for a moment. I mean, if you know your Bible, you know that between Genesis 3 and this scene in Revelation 22, if you see the face of God, you're dead, right? Because God is perfectly holy and perfectly righteous, and we are the opposite of those things. So God cannot, we cannot exist in the presence of God's holiness. But Revelation 22 tells us that on that day, we will be fundamentally, dramatically changed, that we will no longer stand before God clothed in our sin and in our guilt and in our shame, but instead we will stand before him clothed in a righteousness that was purchased for us at the cross of Calvary. And we will no longer stand before him afraid. We will no longer stand before him filled with shame. Instead, we will stand before him with an absolute confidence because we have been invited into the presence of the king. But we will also stand with a great humility, knowing that a huge price was paid for that to be able to happen. Not only that. But in heaven, all of the things that we know on a gut, fundamental level that are wrong will finally be made right. So much of our dissatisfaction in this world, I believe, is really an undercover longing for heaven. And I'm not talking about sinful dissatisfaction. I'm not talking about those moments where we stare at the good gifts that God has given us and we call those not good enough. I'm talking about all those things that we see in society and that we see in our own selves that we know are broken and we long to see healed. We see the suffering. We see the injustice. We see evil people thriving and good people struggling. We see the rape. We see the abuse. We see the violence. We see the wars. We see the school and grocery store shootings. Listen, we know that this isn't right, and society has no answer for these problems. We live in a society that can't even define truth for us. And a society that allows truth to be defined on an individual level cannot possibly offer us any sort of objective right and wrong. It cannot offer us any sort of objective ethic by which we must live. And yet there are so many of us in our desire for a good thing who are looking to sinful humanity, flawed humans for some sort of deliverance. 
And if that's us, I think that our passage is reminding us that our hope might be anchored in the wrong place. Because the truth is, politicians cannot legislate heaven. But that's what we're trying to do. Universal health care. Every person's needs being met. Every person a contributing member of society. All people created equal. No discrimination based on race or based on ethnicity or based on economic standing. All good ideas. All godly ideas. The problem is we as sinful humans are the ones trying to implement them. And we have this unique and creative gift that we can take anything, even the best of good things, and we can twist them into something that is evil. And so this is not to say that we shouldn't pursue good law. We should pursue good law. This isn't to say that we shouldn't pursue justice. We absolutely should pursue justice. What this is saying is that our ultimate hope cannot be tied to somehow creating utopia, to somehow creating heaven here on earth. Everything good attempted here on earth is but a shadow of what's to come. It's an echo of heaven in the heart of sinful man. But this is the hope of heaven. Life and society finally purified and finally made holy. And not only will society finally be made right, our own bodies and souls will finally be made right. I'll confess to you here today, I do not hate my sin the way that I should. But in those moments of gospel clarity, when the Lord lets me see my sin for what it truly is, I find myself longing for a life finally set free. So I would ask you, aren't you tired of your sin? Aren't you tired of lust? Being drawn seemingly without hope to expressions to perverse expressions of what was meant to be a good and perfect gift within marriage? Aren't you tired of selfishness? Ruining relationships by allowing your own selfish desires to erode what was meant to be life-giving? Aren't you tired of your anger? Apologizing time and time again for your resentment, for your silent treatment, for your angry outbursts, only to find yourself repeating the same behavior over and over and over again? Aren't you tired of running from your sin? Rather than confronting our sin head on and actually finding relief and deliverance, instead pacifying our unrest with some sort of medication or some sort of substance or some sort of entertainment, something to numb it so we don't have to deal with it anymore. Aren't you tired of your pride? Working so hard to gain the approval of others through the way that we think and talk and act. Aren't you tired of pursuing what you think will make you happy? Only to find that once you've achieved it, it couldn't deliver what it had promised. And so we find ourselves looking desperately for some new form of salvation, some new God, something else to make us happy. Listen, this might be the most hopeful thing you hear from me all day. The promise of heaven is life unshackled from our sin. Heaven is life as it was always meant to be. Something we desire on a soul level, but we know we've never found. Randy Alcorn in his book called Heaven describes it in this way. Heaven is the place where there is no death, no suffering, no funeral homes, abortion clinics, or psychiatric wards, no rape, missing children, or drug rehabilitation centers, no bigotry, no muggings or killings, no worry or depression or economic downturns, no wars, no unemployment, no anguish over failure and miscommunication, no con men, no locks, no death, no mourning, no pain, no boredom. No arthritis, no handicaps, no cancer, no taxes, no bills, no computer crashes, no weeds, no bombs, no drunkenness, no traffic jams and accidents, no septic tank backups. Praise God, I have five kids. No mental illness. No unwanted emails, close friendships, but no clicks, laughter, but no put downs, intimacy, but no temptation to immorality, 
No hidden agendas, no backroom deals, no betrayals. Imagine mealtimes full of stories, laughter, and joy without fear of insensitivity, inappropriate behavior, anger, gossip, lust, jealousy, hurt feelings, or anything that eclipses joy. That will be heaven. Hmm. It's like three people are excited about that. That's, <laughs> I, it's kind of been the story of the day. It's okay. <laughs> This and this picture is what our eyes are supposed to be focused on. This picture is the hope for us as believers. We know that this life is not all that there is. We know that this life is not yet what it was meant to be. So our passage, it offers us a confidence in our hope. It offers us the destination of our hope. But finally, it confirms the duration of our hope. Back to our big idea, our ultimate hope as believers is that we will dwell in the house of the Lord, if you're taking notes, underline the word, forever. Our ultimate hope as believers is that the salvation that we have is an eternal salvation. And this eternity is what offers perspective on all the trials and all the sufferings of this life. This eternal perspective is what allows us as Christians to reconcile the promises of God that we see in scripture with the suffering that we experience in this life. It is this view of eternity that allows us as Christians to look at scriptures like Psalm 8411 that says, our God bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. And it allows us to read that passage of scripture while still walking through suffering, while still walking through disease, while still walking through cancer, while still walking through broken relationships, while still walking through death. It allows us to reconcile these things and put them together because nowhere in the scriptures are we ever promised that this life was going to be easy. Nowhere in this life were we ever, nowhere in the scriptures were we ever promised that in this life we would be given every external reason for joy. Nowhere in the scriptures are we promised that the end of the valley of the shadow of death is going to be in this life. In fact, if you look at biblical history and all of church history, there are so many people who have walked faithfully after the Lord and yet their lives have ended. That valley has ended in this life with suffering and even martyrdom. It is this perspective of eternity that reminds us that every yes to the promise of God is finally going to be realized when we go to dwell with him forever. It is this view of eternity that allowed Paul to write in Romans 8.18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not even worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. I said this a few weeks ago, but the life that we are living today is really just a sliver on the front edge of eternity. The best case scenario, we get like 80 to 100 years here on this earth, but that is nothing compared to eternity in the presence of our God, an eternity where a million years into dwelling with him, we are no closer to the end than the day that we first arrived. Some of the best lyrics I think that were ever penned. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. It is this perspective that has empowered the heroes of the faith for thousands of years. C.S. Lewis wrote, if you read history, You will find that the Christians who did the most for this present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next. I think that's true. It is this view of eternity that has inspired saints throughout church history to endure persecution and suffering and hardship, to live with seemingly incomprehensible generosity and selflessness and sacrifice. Why? Because they weren't living for today. They knew and they know that this life is fleeting and it is just a hiccup on the road to eternity. Our ultimate hope as believers is that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the hope that should motivate and drive us in every aspect of our lives every day. So the question remains what it was at the beginning of our time together. Where is your hope anchored? 
Where have you set your hope? Have you set it on this life or have you set it on the life that is to come? Maybe more pointedly, the question would be, if you were to die tonight, are you absolutely confident that you will dwell in the house of your God forever or not? And I think there's really only three answers to that question. I think there are three kinds of people that are represented here today. The first are the ones that would say yes. And man, if that's you, praise God. If you have set your hope on Jesus, if you have placed your hope in his life and death and resurrection, then the prayer for you, the prayer becomes, God, would you just help me to finish well? In a few moments, we're gonna spend some time praying and that would be how I would encourage you to pray. God, would you help me to stay focused on eternity? Would you keep me from being distracted by all of the things that would pull me away, all of the things that would promise happiness and satisfaction outside of you? Would you help me to leave a godly legacy for the generations to follow? The second answer is maybe. Maybe. And I'll be honest with you, it's been surprising and sad how many people I have talked to, even in this church, who have been in church since they were kids, who have heard the gospel time and time again, and yet when asked, if you were to die tonight, would you spend eternity in heaven? Their their answer is, well, I hope so. I mean, I think I've lived a pretty good life. I hope by the end of things, the good things have outweighed the bad. I think God should let me in, but you gotta know if that's your answer, which only you can truly answer, only you can truly know, that's not the gospel. That's an anti-gospel. For anyone who has put their faith in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, the maybe in our answers have been removed completely because Jesus doesn't need you to add to your salvation. He doesn't need you to take anything away. And so for you, if that's you, then your prayer when we pray here in a moment is, God, would you help me to live with the confidence that your son died to purchase on my behalf? I'm sorry for all the ways that I have tried to add or to earn your favor. Would you just help me to rest in what you've already done? A third answer, a third kind of person here today your answer would be no. You know that you've never had a relationship with Jesus. You know that you've never surrendered to him. And you need to know something. God is a purposeful and intentional God. He has brought you into this place on this day at this time so that you would hear this invitation. Your God is not a God of exclusion. He's a God of inclusion. He says, come to me as you are and let me change you. It doesn't cost you money. You don't have to clean yourself up before you come. You just come to me as you are. And if you surrender to me, if you leave your old life behind, would you just commit to following me one day at a time? That is all that he asks. But you gotta know that your God puts that decision. He allows you to make that decision. He's not gonna strong arm you into the kingdom. And if you choose to reject him, it won't be because your God has rejected you. It'll be because you've pushed God away. And in the same way that the scriptures say that for those who are in Jesus, we will spend an eternity in heaven. We're a million years into our stay. We are no closer to the end than when we began. When we choose to reject Jesus, the only other option the scriptures say is that we are choosing to send ourselves to hell, a place of torment where eternity, a million years into our torment, we are no closer to relief than the day that we arrived. And so you just got to know what it is that you're choosing today. And your God, he's not angry. Your God is not vindictive. He has been good and he has been kind. And it is evidenced in the fact that you are here right now listening to that invitation. That door is open to cross from death into life, from darkness into light. Your God is inviting you today. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads and close your eyes. For some of you, these next few moments, your prayer needs to become, God, would you help me finish well? Would you help me keep my eyes on eternity? Would you allow me to leave a godly legacy? For some of you, your prayer in this moment needs to be, God, would you help me to live in the confidence of what Jesus has already accomplished for me? Would you take the maybe out of my answer? For those of you whose answer is no, your prayer is a prayer of repentance. 
God, I need you to save me. I'm turning away from my old self and I'm choosing to follow you. So with everyone's head bowed and everyone's eyes closed, I would just ask if there's anyone here today who wants to make that decision, who wants to put that flag in the sand and say, say today is the day where I am leaving my old life and I'm going to follow Jesus. If that's you, would you mind just putting your hand in the air? We're not gonna spotlight you. We're not gonna call you forward. I just wanna know if you're here so I can pray for you. Is there anyone here that would be making that decision? Heavenly Father, thank you for being a good and kind shepherd. Thank you for being the kind of God that doesn't leave us to our own devices, that doesn't leave us in our own sin and in our own guilt and our own shame, but instead you sent Jesus. Thank you for being a good and kind shepherd who has so faithfully cared for us. Thank you for walking with us through the sweet pastures and through the still waters. Thank you for walking with us through the valley of the shadow of death and thank you for the promise of heaven. I pray for my friends here today that you would allow us to fix our eyes on eternity, that it wouldn't just be this abstract idea for the future, but it would be the kind of thing that would motivate and change the way we live in the here and now. I pray that you would instill in us a longing for heaven, that we would not allow ourselves to become satisfied with what this world offers but that we, like Casper Ten Boom, we, like King David, would no longer live for today, but will live for eternity. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. Waiting
a glorious day that will be when we see him face to face. Amen. We are so glad that you were able to join us today. And if you're one of those that crossed that line of faith today, we would just love to pray with you. There's going to be some friends down here in the front that would love to pray with you. And even if you have any other prayer requests, maybe you have a tough meeting this week or just some difficulties that you want prayer for, we'd be happy and privileged to be able to pray with you about that. Otherwise, we will see you next week. Make sure to bring your Bibles with you. God bless you.